Neil deGrasse Tyson and his prehistoric counterpart, Neil DeBuck Weasel, ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and guess who's back to talk movies? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me back. All right. You're, it's been a long time, you know. It, I know. You've, Sitting by my phone, and you, no, you don't call. And you've been in like four movies since, <laughs> seriously, since you've been here. You're I, like, I've lost, I haven't been counting. But you're maybe. the Benedict Cumberbatch of scientists. <laughs> you're, you're in everything. All right, today we're going to focus on two of them. The newest installment in the Ice Age franchise has our favorite woolly mammoths on a collision course with a meteor in this family-friendly apocalypse movie. From 20th Century Fox and Blue Sky Studios. My wish came true. I'm okay! Mine too. The defining chapter. Meteor shower! Meteor shower? In the greatest trilogy. The mother of all asteroids screaming towards us. But I've got a plan. Who's with me? Crashing Eddie, Eddie reporting, reporting for duty. <laughs> duty. <laughs> Ice Age collision course. All right. Let's talk about Neil DeBuck Weasel. <gasps> Famed astrophysicist Neil DeBuck Weasel! He knows the cosmos. Where can I buy a Neil DeBuck Weasel action doll? I, well, I don't looked. know. I'm told that they're going to make one. Are you serious? I'm told, but I don't, I, I haven't seen one yet, so I don't know. Okay. I'm, I'm told it's in the, in the list. Okay, all right, good to know. And, uh, yeah, I was a, a, a weasel. I'm a weasel. And did they want your scientific input at all? Yes. In fact, once I saw the scenes that I was in, I said, well, you know, I, I, by the way, I'm ha very happy to give very broad swaths of creative latitude and artistic latitude. Yes, you but are. But just make sure that some basic science is accurate. You're not a stickler when it comes oh, to science movies. People, not, yeah. people try to cast me, try, try to characterize me yeah. that way, but it's act I don't think it's true. Yeah. The, I, I'm a fan of... I may have said this the last time I was on, uh, Mark Twain has a, has a nice quote. It's, f this should be taken to heart by all artists. First get your facts straight, then distort them at your leisure. Right. So, but if you start out with ideas that have no foundation in any reality, and then you start distorting them artistically, you're, you're floating chaos. in nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And we live in a day where we have people who, there's enough science literacy percolating in the in the internet that if you do something scientifically literate amid your creative artistic expressions somebody's going to blog about it they take a look at this look what they thought through look what they did right and so i think there's 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 payoff for getting some of the science right before you start fantasizing so yes they ask what do i think of this what do i think of that uh, in this Can you scene. give me an example of where you maybe put in your input? Uh, yeah, so but there's a scene where the Scrat is experiencing very high force of gravity because he's on a spaceship where, that where you can control the force of gravity. It's, it's the future. This is an alien flying saucer. And, and don't ask. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> I'll take it. Oh, yeah, just, just accept I'm that. I'm with you. Okay. It, 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 it's an alien flying saucer that he happens upon, and he's just chasing his acorn, and the act of chasing the acorn, he's accidentally bumping levers and pulling knobs, and there's a scene where the gravity gets very high, and he finds himself sort of stuck to the ground trying to move and then his jaw hangs to the ground and it's a, there are little aspects of that scene that I said well it wouldn't happen that way it would happen this way if you could do that and they were responsive and and not only in certain scenes but in in the script that they had imagined for me uh, advising Buck Weasel so yeah no they 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 were good about it and by the way these are these people care about the science That's they really cool. do it's a new frontier of scientifically literate producers, artists. These are people who took science in college and
and liked it. Yeah. Whether or not they decided to major in it. And look at what happens when people start liking science yeah. and they go off into their walks of life. Uh, you can transform the world. A scientifically literate artist has a much bigger palette to draw upon than one who is not. Yeah. That's how I would put it. So if we applied some level of realism to this, where on, where on the Earth's timeline would, would this sort of storyline fall? Nowhere. You know? <laughs> Nowhere? Oh, oh okay. yeah. so, so what's funny to me is uh, they're trying to not go extinct by this asteroid that, has been, that legend says will collide with Earth. Uh, I didn't want to be the one to say, look guys, every one of you is going extinct anyway. <laughs> After the Ice Age, no saber-toothed tigers, no mammoths, no mastodons, no, feathery no, dinosaurs. no giant yeah. sloths. Now, in this film, just some things to notice. They had dinosaurs in it. I know. And, and you say, well, what are dinosaurs doing in the Ice Age? Well, well, they used their knowledge of paleontology, the illustrators, and said, we know that there were some dinosaurs that survived the asteroid collision of 65 million years ago. And they had wings. And they birthed the entire lineage of modern birds. So they threw this in there. Now, they're, ch they're too chubby for their wings to have worked, but they're cuter as little chubby dinosaurs. Right. But they're flying dinosaurs. Right. They're clearly dinosaurs, and they can fly. And so, but that being said, birds were way more developed by the time of the Ice Age than what is shown in the film. Wait, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of funny business with the timeline. But, but you I still, mentioned the asteroid. So, but there was an asteroid that collided with Earth? It's happening all the time. There are asteroids coming all the Earth time? Earth plows through several hundred tons of meteors a day. Why don't we feel the boom? Well, because there's, most of what happens in a day are small and they burn up and we see them as shooting stars. Oh. Occasionally they're bigger and they make it through and they'll hit the ground. Uh, but On rarer occasions, they are large enough to make a crater and alter the ecosystem, such as what happened 65 million years ago, such as what could easily happen once again. Uh, easily when? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're very casual about okay. this, Neil. Uh, how easily it can happen and how accurately we know it are two different things. So here's a great image of, uh, isn't it evidence that we've been hit before? Sure. Take a look at the surface of the moon. That one does not have weather to, to erase the evidence of yeah. having get, gotten hit in the past. Here, this one dates to about 50,000 years ago. This is the great meteor crater in Arizona. And so there you go. You didn't, wouldn't want to be there when that happened. You're telling me it's inevitable. We're going to get an asteroid that now I know becomes a meteor. Well, unless we, uh, could we save ourselves? Unless we, we need the, the foresight. Excuse me. We need the, the political... Uh, focus to garner resources so that the next time we discover an asteroid that might hit us, we can then go out and deflect it. And it's way more complicated than you might think. N not the deflecting part, deciding how you do it part, culturally, politically. Because let's say there's Wait, an asteroid. So I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Hold on. Is there a science? way to do it yes. and then you're saying that's not complicated that's not complicated so, okay so tell me the science we got the science thing. tell me that we got the science and then tell me the complicated okay there's several we got 12 ways to deflect an asteroid all right there's the <laughs> that, macho that sounds like a simon and garfunkel <laughs> song 12 ways to deflect an asteroid well that would have been just paul simon oh, oh 50 so, ways thank to leave you. your lover sorry. yeah it was after sorry sorry simon and garfunkel I'm a big fan of their music. That's why <laughs> Thank I you. Call you out on that. Uh, and, and well, you should. On your should. own show. Well, I'm sorry. You should. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Give me, give me your top two ways to deflect an asteroid. Uh, well, the, there's the macho way. Uh, that's, you know, you, you're imagining the, 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 the war general. You know, let's blow the sucker out of the sky. You know, right? we got nukes. Let's, so you send out nukes and you, you destroy it. And then it becomes harmless little bits that then burn up in an atmosphere. Okay. But, the problem is we're really good at blowing stuff up yep. and we're less good at knowing where the pieces go afterwards. Suppose you blow it up and then now it's two pieces. Now you have to evacuate two parts of Earth yeah. instead of just one. Uh, a kinder, gentler solution would be they have worked on a gravitational tractor beam where you send a, a, a space probe adjacent to, and, and you match orbits, and you put it adjacent to the asteroid and watch what happens and you park it there and there they are moving well they'll feel each other's gravity 
and they'll want to move towards one another. But you have little retro rockets on your space probe and you don't let that happen. You pull away. Very coy. It's very, okay, very now watch. Coy. So they try to get, nope, yeah, don't oh, let yeah, that happen, yeah. all right? You now, want me? You want me? Yeah, yeah, right? nope, yeah, keep, keep trying, right, keep trying. Right. And as that happens. And then finally that proposes and they live happily ever after. Well, it, it, it proposes in a space-time trajectory that no longer collides with Earth. You have actually attracted it out of the path of harm's way. Yes, and that's for me the best one because then you can monitor how well you're doing. Sure. Right? It, sure. And, and from the beginning through the end of it, it's gradual. And it'll still be there to harm you in another day, but if you're good at this, you can just knock any of the ones out of the way that, are, that, are, that have Earth's name on it. So now I see, though, these are huge multicultural, multinational decisions. Here you go. Hence so the let's problem. say. Who pays for it? Who gets to do it? Who pushes it's, the button? It's even worse than that. So, yes, who pays for it? Suppose it's headed for the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Does the United States? spend the trillion dollars to deflect it? Or does India pay? But India doesn't have the space program the way the United States does, right. or the way we once did, right? The, in, in order to deflect it. So who does this? DreamWorks. So what They're you would need is some kind of tax, although that's an evil word in modern times, but some kind of uh, payment into an account, perhaps scaled to your GDP, your country's GDP, is a pot of money. When you find an asteroid, whoever is best able to deflect it, this is what they spend to do so. Okay? That's kind of what you have to do. Now, watch what happens. Suppose there is an asteroid headed for the United States, and we go to deflect it, and then it fails. And we only partially deflect it, and then it hits Europe. Who's responsible? Then we... And suppose it hits a political enemy by accident. Right. What does that mean? Right. All right, so we got the science. It's the people problem that is always the frontier of making any of this work. The Ice Age franchise is all about prehistoric animals, and of course they're ignorant uh, about a ton of things, and, and appropriately they continually mangle a very basic scientific rule. Correlation does not imply causation. Without that rule, do you think we would be, you know, stuck in a scientific Ice Age? Well, so, so I think that that sentence is, has been given more weight than it deserves, if I may. You may. Uh, it is true that correlation does not require causation. But almost everything in this world that is correlated is causal. Is causal. Is causal. Almost everything. So it's, you sh we shouldn't be shocked if someone wants to infer causation and ultimately learn that it's not. Almost everything is causal. You, you flick a switch, the light turns on. You put one foot in front of another, you move forward. Friction propels you forward. You press the gas pedal, the car accelerates. Okay, you're coming All up with a whole bunch of scientific examples that are undeniable. No, but no. I'm, no, but I'm thinking of, of, of Thick, dangerous cumulus ones. cumulus clouds, no, no, rain no, comes out of them. What about when people use them for social things and, and things that, could, that turn into racism? Like, like you know, uh, a disproportionate number of... Uh, people of color end up in jail and they grow up in a certain place. Then you say, oh, you grew up in this city, you're going to be a criminal, right? Right. That kind of application of, of correlation. No, so what the, the way you should say that is, is what, is what are the statistics of you becoming a criminal if you grew up under those conditions? Is it higher or lower than if you grew up in dis different right, conditions? Right, but it doesn't cause it, right? Well, it can. I mean, it, it, well, well so, so the problem is socially... It, people are really complicated things. So socially, it's hard to point to a cause that results in someone's behavior in 100% oh, of the cases. Right. Okay? Right. And what's intriguing to me is how much attention we give to people who come from broken homes and then don't do well in life. And then we say, well, it's because of the broken home. When I think, yes, that should be studied. That's not causal, right? Wait, wait, wait. But I think we should spend as much, if not more, attention studying the people who came from broken homes but succeeded. There's a whole population of such people. People with divorced parents or, or, or the, the abuse, they nonetheless succeeded. So we should ask, how did they succeed? Right. 
in the face of these forces that would otherwise constrict success. And I don't think there's enough studies, and there should be, because there, there could be lessons in there that you then apply. The positive study. The, the positive yeah. study, yeah, yeah. and apply that to the cases where people um, have, have where their lives have have gone astray. Now you didn't you didn't as as far as I know come from a broken home, but they but you you were unique among the kids you grew up with to grow up to become an astrophysicist, right? I, I mean, think most people who became astrophysicists ultimately were unique in childhood. <laughs> I mean, how many astrophysicists are, are there, there in general in right, the world? There right. aren't. There's one in a million. If but you want to do the know, do the statistics on it, this story about you as a kid, you can remind us how old you were. You weren't you weren't three. You were a little like you apparently. I was nine. Went, I was went, nine. And you saw stars, and you're like, oh my gosh, this changed. Well, I saw stars, projected stars, right. in, in the Hayden Planetarium. Because you had grown up in the city and didn't see the stars. Yeah, I didn't see the stars at all. And then I go into the planetarium, a, a family trip, and whoa. What is this? Uh, that's a hoax. There can't be this many stars. I know how many stars there are. There's like 12 <laughs> in the night sky. That's how many I counted from the Bronx, where I grew up. And I would later, of course, learn that that projected the real sky, or version of the real sky. And but why I aren't more kids in the Bronx growing up to be, or maybe they are, increasingly growing maybe up? Maybe they are. I, I don't know. I don't track that. But I can tell you that. Um, many people who are astrophysicists were sort of amateur astronomers as kids and owned telescopes, and they were in many ways, many occasions, the weird kid in, the, in their class. And so my story is not actually unusual. Ah. You may think it's unusual because I'm the only story you know, because how many astrophysicists do people know? Right. How many occasions do you have to put an astrophysicist's life story on television? Right. It's just, it does, it's not common. So... To, to hear the story, that doesn't mean the story itself is uncommon. And um, what's the weirdest thing you did? I mean, were you a weird kid? Name one really weird thing about you when you were a kid, please. Oh, uh, it's, this is too obscure. Let me, let, me give you, let me give you the second weirdest thing. No, we, we of course <laughs> want the most weirdest thing, please. Uh, <laughs> you want the most weirdest thing. Totally. The mostest weirdest thing. Of course we do. Really? Okay. Um, so, I don't know, when I was 12 or 13, I memorized the fifth root of 100 to 12 decimal places. That's I, I still really it's 2.511886431.52. If you take that number and multiply it by itself five consecutive times, you get 100.0000000. And there's an obscure reason why one would want to know that in astrophysics. And it's, t it's so obscure. I will not waste. But at twelve, you wanted valuable to know it? air time. Oh yeah, well I knew at age nine I wanted to to study. So that number is the factor difference in brightness between consecutive magnitude numbers, referencing the brightness of stars in the night sky. That's why you wanted to know it. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted just to, to know that accurately, and that's just a kind of weird thing. Other, other it's things. A great weird thing. It's just it's just weird. You know, I'm up all hours of the night with my telescope, and everyone is asleep or doing fun things. But I'm you were doing something communing fun, communing with the cosmos, yeah, with my telescope. Yeah. And I walked dogs. Um, later on, in middle school and high school, I, li I lived in an apartment complex, and I walked dogs for a living in the in the in the golden age of dog walking. Which is when, when you didn't have to pick up. Didn't the have poop? to pick up the oh poop. My God. <laughs> That's you a walk terrible nine dogs, age. And they just pooping, and I just keep walking. That is a brown age of dog walking. That, <laughs> that is not was, golden. That is, not if you, the one has to be doing that's it. That's true. So 50 cents per dog per walk. I was able to quickly assemble money to get a next generation telescope and a camera. And I had a dark room. I converted my um, bathroom into a dark room back in the day when that's how, that's how you obtain photographs of whatever you took a picture of. So yeah, I, I did. I did this. I just got to tell you, as as I am now a mother, I, I think every mother's dream is that her, her child would be as weird as you were. That is amazing. Well, you have to be a geeky. You have to be a geek sympathizer, mom. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I'm a geek. <laughs> and then you grow up to be a movie star. I mean, you're having a very artistic year. We see you in the um, Adam Nimoy film that he created for his father, for the love of Spock. The movie started out as one thing, and then Leonard Nimoy died, and Adam Nimoy turned the work into a valentine to his dad, creating a lovely film about an artist, actor, and father. When word came out today that actor Leonard Nimoy had died, the president said, 
I love Spock. Do we do we like Spock because of his logic, or, or I mean, you know, it's a logic that made him solid and sure. Yes, yes, you knew. But there's that part of science that you're saying that that compels you and fuels you, which is not being sure. Oh no, no, no he's sure of what he's sure of, and he's not sure of what he knows he's not sure mm. of. This is a, this is the. By the way, I cannot overemphasize the importance of that distinction. A good scientist is completely candid about his or her ignorance and say, you know, I, have, I don't have a clue. Half of being smart is, is knowing what you, you don't, don't know, know. Mm -hmm. and recognizing that you don't know it and then put, And putting, being vulnerable enough to say this is... I, I, like, I, I don't know. Right. If, and so there are people who think scientists, they were just sitting back, you know, legs up on the desk, masters of knowledge. And I've had people come up to me and say, uh, here's something I bet scientists can't even explain that. What do you have to say about that? As though this <laughs> like is like they stumped you, <laughs> right? And I'm uh, scientists are not some unstumpable um, species of human. In fact, if we are good, we will navigate our way to the boundary between what is known and unknown in this universe, and park there. Stay there. That's. I, I, that's the place I want to live. So that every time I look this way, okay, I got my tools here. I look that way, oh my gosh. How do I even apply these tools? Do I need tools yet invented in order to even ask the question so that I can reach out into that bit of unknown? And it reminds me of the, the famous reference to this, which is as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. The more, you, the, more, the more you know, the more questions you have. Yeah. And in fact, people say, what are the questions science needs to know? And I say, I don't think that way. I, I don't think that way. I think about not the big questions that we're seeking answers to. I think about the questions we don't even yet know to ask. ask. Because they will only arise after these other questions have been answered. It's the yet to be understood questions the questions yet to even be formulated that I seek. You know, some people are drawn, their idea of science is, is repeatable and immutable and logical. Is, uh, is that the best part of science? No, no, You're it's, it's not about, science is not about logic. It's not? No, no, no. There are people who will try to argue differently, but I'm telling you, science is not about logic. Is it about whatever you would define as the opposite of that? No, 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 no. Tell me why it's not about logic. No, no, logic matters if you have a mathematical representation of your idea, okay. then logic drives what you derive from that, okay? Because math follows logical rules. But the creativity of the scientist on the frontier has nothing to do with logic. It's what, if you come up with ideas and they don't logically necessarily come from some previous idea, all right? Quantum physics, you don't derive that from classical physics. There, there were experiments nobody could explain. So come up with, I don't know, maybe light comes in quanta, in particles. I don't know. Let's test it. Holy God. Yes. My gosh. Is that logic? No. Yeah. No. There's Einstein. Oh, um, let me make these assumptions. Light, speed of light, everybody measures it the same, and the laws of physics are the same in every reference frame. Let me just see what happens. Oh, my gosh, time slows down. Um, uh, oh, inertia he... increases. Uh, uh, Space-time warps. And he called his flash of intuition when he had this, imag like he imagined a man falling off of a building, which is, you know, how he got to space-time. He called that the happiest thought of his life. And it was just a, it was just a visual. And, a man and, falls off of a building. And if you go to him and say, are you being logical in this moment? That is not the, Even, uh, that is not the proper word yeah. to describe what's going on. That's all I'm saying. So when someone says, uh, it's logical that this must be the case, it's that, don't, that, stay away from that word. Just, just, it applies in, a, in restricted ways when you have a working theory of the universe and then you derive mathematical consequences to it. That's where logic matters. But when you try to, when Feynman came up with, with you know, what we today call Feynman diagrams, it's, if it was purely logical to have gotten there, anyone else could have just done that. But it's a leap of creative thinking that gets there. And that is not the same 
uh, sandbox that you find the word logic. That's all I'm saying. And so, so um, people say, oh, that can't happen. That's not logical. Uh, quantum physics is not logical in the eyes of classical physics. There's a lot of things in science that's not simply logical. But it is. And I've said this many times. The universe is under no obligation to make <laughs> sense to you. <laughs> is it logical that the universe was once the size of an atom? That's not logical. It's not you know, logic. But it, what? all evidence tells us that. It's about evidence more than it's about logic. So you have science. Um, uh, when it arrives at an objective truth, this is the fun part. Multiple experiments get conducted, and we all get about the same answer. That is the sign of a new emergent truth. Mm. Then you put that in the textbooks, and then you move on. That will not one day be shown to be false. NDT. You you make science so excited. You know what science says? To no, you? I don't make science. Si says thank you. No, I don't. I know science is already excited. It's already excited. I'm just revealing that to whoever will pay attention. Thank That's you for revealing doing. it today. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have time for. You can find out more about this and other subjects on our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab. Thank you.